In case you're wondering why this looks slightly weird, the perspective of my head is reversed. How? Let me explain. Perspective is something you may remember from your architecture drawing classes. One or two vanishing points, horizons and so on. Long story short, more distant things appear smaller. But perspective is something that affects faces as well. When photographers are taking portraits, they spend a lot of time thinking about the focal length of camera lenses. Usually people say one should use a focal length which is as long or longer than the human eye. Something like 50 millimeters, for example. But why? For one, the longer the focal length, the easier it is to get a nice and blurry background for portraits. But there is something else. Our brain is extremely sensitive to very small changes in facial features. And lenses distort faces. A long focal length removes the perspective and a short one makes it more noticeable. But even if that may look extreme, that's still a regular perspective. So how would faces look like if we reverse it? The closer something is to the camera, the smaller it appears. So the tip of my nose is mostly normal, while my ears are absurdly enlarged. It's a bit like unfolding a face. I hired my favorite model for a few portraits. Most of the images look a lot funnier if someone is experiencing this perspective change for the very first time. If you're wondering how all of this works, it's time for a bit of theory. Imagine we've got a camera and two objects of the same height but at different distances. Due to perspective distortion, the tree closer to the camera is depicted larger. If we increase the distance and the focal length at the same time, objects appear to change their size. Once the focal length gets close to infinity, the perspective distortion is completely gone and we end up with something that looks like an orthogonal projection. If you have used a 3D modeling application before, you probably have already seen that. By the way, this funky transition effect is called a dolly zoom in filmmaking. But how does it work with cameras? The human eye is using a single lens to focus light on the retina. In front of the eye is an iris, similar to the aperture in a camera lens. The aperture lets some light rays pass and blocks others. If objects are farther away, the light gets focused onto a smaller space on the retina or camera sensor. Technically, that's called an entocentric camera and we rarely even think about this type of perspective because it's how our eye works and basically every lens you can buy for a standard camera. But there are other types of lenses as well. If we add another lens and move the aperture to its focal point, the aperture allows only very specific rays to pass. The result looks like an image from an infinite focal length lens. Objects get depicted at the same size no matter how close they are to the camera. There is no perspective distortion anymore. Edmund Optics has a nice video that shows how this looks in reality. These types of lenses are usually sold for machine vision tasks, like measuring parts in a factory line. As you might have guessed, the telecentric lens only sees objects smaller than itself. Why? Every lens has something that's called the entrance pupil. That's the narrowest point through which light can pass, usually the aperture. What's slightly unintuitive is that the entrance pupil is not the physical aperture itself, but the size of the image of the aperture seen through the front of the lens. For the telecentric lens, this pupil is not located inside the lens, but infinitely far away and almost as large as the lens itself. So, finally, let's get to what I promised earlier, reverse the perspective. If we place the iris very close to the imaging plane and at a lens, the imaginary entrance pupil is located in front of the first glass element. If we now put something in between the entrance pupil and the glass, the magic happens. The aperture picks the rays that let objects appear larger the closer they are to the entrance pupil. Since the entrance pupil is behind the object, the perspective is reversed. Let's look at our trees. 
By moving farther away, objects appear larger. Funky. And we can see that in our portraits as well. The closer the head moves to the entrance pupil in the back, the stronger the effect. That's called a hypercentric camera, and the most important part of this optical system is the diameter of the entrance pupil. So, our first lens must be larger than whatever you want to take an image of. And if you want to take portraits, well, your lenses better be much bigger than a head. It's pretty much impossible to buy a conventional lens this size, so I had to go with a Fresnel lens. Last tangent, I promise. Auguste Fresnel was a French physicist who was tasked with improving the brightness of lighthouses. He knew, and that's a simplification, that the light is not refracted by the glass of the lens itself, but by the surfaces where glass and air meet. So he split a large lens surface into a lot of smaller segments. That these gorgeous glass enclosures around the lights and lighthouses. Unfortunately, these segments cause a bit of trouble if you want to actually take photos through a Fresnel lens. That's why they are almost exclusively used for illumination and not so much for imaging purposes. Fun fact, these Fresnel lenses in lighthouses are still immensely heavy, yet they need to rotate as frictionless as possible because they were manually operated. So what's the solution? Of course, just let them float on a layer of liquid mercury. So, if you ever wondered about these stories of lighthouse keepers going insane, now you know. However, when it comes to lenses, we don't have a choice. So, I got myself the largest Fresnel lens a company would sell me. The lens was shipped in a very flat wooden tray packaged with the emblematic Chinese yellow wrapping tape, but it made its way completely unharmed. The lens has a focal length of 700 mm. The enclosure has a total length of 1500 mm. If the camera is close to the Fresnel lens, the effect should be minimal, while it should be perfect at a distance of about two focal lengths. I wanted to make use of that, so I built a lens enclosure with a motorized gantry. In the center, the image sensor is mounted. The sensor is actually just a regular camera with a zoom lens. The lens on the camera allows us to focus and provides the aperture we need to make the whole optical system hypercentric. The gantry itself runs on wheels so it can be moved along the enclosure. This is done by a stepper motor and a toothed belt. A second motor is adjusting the focal length of the zoom lens. All of this is controlled by a Raspberry Pi mini computer. But moving the camera back and forth is just a nice gimmick to have this effect. Taking photos works without any motors. The rest is pretty simple. The front and back ring are laser cut sheet metal and everything else are V-slot aluminum profiles and 3D printed parts. The lens will need a lot of light, so I'm reusing a hula hoop ring as a diffuser for an LED strip. That's our ring light. I used some tarp I'd lying around to make the enclosure light tight because the Fresnel lens has no anti-reflection coating and just a tiny bit of stray light already looks horrible. For most of the imaging errors, the Fresnel lens can be blamed. Mine had an issue in the center in particular, where the shallow curvature is creating a local distortion in the image. But still, it's working. And it's pretty bonkers. So, is that useful? Absolutely not. But is it funny? Well, you decide. As you can imagine, I'm absolutely not the first person who is doing this absurd stuff. Ben Cresno of Applied Science made a great video about lenses that see behind objects and got me started on this. I'm using the same technique to get a regular camera to hypercentricity, just a bit fancier. There's a blog post by Yuji Hayashi and another video by Curious Mark applying the effect to giant head boxes. There's even a whole Flickr group of ugly face pictures with Fresnel lenses. Links to all of that are in the description. In any case, if you want to build your own tiny hypercentric lens, just grab a simple positive lens like a magnifying glass. If you hold it at just the right distance to something, the iris in your eye acts as a perture and perspective is reversed. If you want to build a large camera, I published the design files and parts list on my website. That's it. I hope you learned something new. 
If you built something similar, let me know. I'm always happy to hear about that.